everybody. Welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube. This is episode number 145 of Warbird Tube. And tonight, we'll take a look back at some of the significant air-related events that took place 80 years ago in 1944. As always, before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, take a second to like, share, subscribe, or follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click that bell icon to get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when we go live. Now, this program is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about the CAF, our events, our airplanes, local units, or how you can join the fun, visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. As 1944 began, the aviation landscape was rapidly changing. Propeller-driven aircraft were giving way to jet-powered designs, promising unprecedented speed and maneuverability. Now, jet designs had been in the research and development stage in Germany, Britain, and the United States since the late 1930s. Technological advances during the war, however, brought jet-powered aircraft to the forefront. Early in 1943, Allied intelligence discovered the Germans' new design, the ME-262. General Hap Arnold believed an airframe developed to accept the British-made Halford H-1B Goblin jet engine could provide the United States with superior performance to match the new German jet. Lockheed was selected to design such an airplane. Lockheed Skunk Works, led by the legendary designer Kelly Johnson, took on the challenge. Johnson declared that he could bring the airplane design to life in 150 days. The XP-80 only took 143 days to become reality and was delivered for testing in November of 1943. The result? The XP-80 Shooting Star, a straight-wing design, single-seat cockpit, tricycle landing gear, quite a departure from the traditional tailwheel configuration. Now, the culmination of Lockheed's effort came to reality January 8, 1944, when the P-80 Shooting Star took to the sky for its maiden flight. The P-80's flight demonstrated the capabilities of jet propulsion. The straight-wing design provided stability, and eventually the General Electric J-33 engine was developed to power the Shooting Star to speeds that surpassed those of contemporary piston engine fighters. Early versions of the XP-80, however, were powered by borrowed British-built jet engines before the J-33 was built. The development of the P-80 was not without its challenges. The initial prototype faced issues like engine fires and structural problems. However, Lockheed's engineers, under Johnson's guidance, swiftly addressed these issues and refined the design. But the P-80 program was not without human loss either. Lockheed's chief test pilot, Milo Burcham, who flew the very first flight of the XP-80, and America's ace of aces, Richard Baum, were both among those killed in crashes of the P-80. Lockheed's legendary test pilot, Tony LeVere, also seriously injured when the XP-80 he was flying suffered an engine failure. The Shooting Star went on to become the United States' first operational jet fighter. With development so close to the end of the war, only two pre-production P-80s saw limited service in Italy with the U.S. Air Force on reconnaissance missions in February and March of 1945. Because of delays in delivery of production aircraft, the Shooting Star saw no actual combat during World War II. The aircraft's breakthroughs in speed, design, and propulsion set the stage for the jet age. The P-80's legacy as a trailblazer in jet technology and its role in shaping the post-war era underscore its significance in aviation history. Of course, the P-80 did see action in the Korean conflict before it, too, was surpassed by the new technology, the swept-wing designs of the North American F-86 and the Soviets. 15. Another technological wonder that saw the spotlight in 1944 was the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. The long-range heavy bomber, capable of striking deep into enemy territory, was developed and unveiled in 1942. However, it wasn't until 1944 that the B-29 entered operational service. The Super Fortress was not just a powerful weapon. 
It was a technological leap forward. Pressurized cabins allowed for higher altitudes, reducing crew fatigue and increasing survivability. Remote-controlled gun turrets added to its defensive capabilities. These innovations came with their own set of challenges, however. The aircraft's complexity demanded highly skilled maintenance crews and mechanical issues were very common. The most common cause of maintenance headaches and catastrophic failures were the engines. Although the Wright R3350 duplex cyclone radial engines later became a trustworthy workhorse in large piston engine aircraft, early models were plagued with reliability problems due to overheating. The problem was not fully cured until the aircraft was fitted with more powerful Pratt & Whitney R4360 WASP engines. The B-29, capable of flying at altitudes up to almost 32,000 feet, and speeds of 350 miles per hour found this their best defense because Japanese fighters couldn't reach that altitude and few could catch a B-29 even if they did get to that altitude. A much anticipated airplane, this training film from 1944 highlights some of the new technology that would define B-29 operations. This is it. This is the B-29, the plane you've been waiting for. And it was worth waiting for. It's the biggest, fastest, mightiest heavy bomber in the world. It can travel farther and higher than anything else on wings. It has a pressurized cabin, permitting high altitude flight without oxygen masks. It has five remotely controlled, electrically driven turrets, each carrying twin 50s with a 20 millimeter cannon added to the turret in the tail. Yes, the B-29 is everything you've been promised. And the pilot who flies one has an enviable job. Important, glamorous, and tough. Here's a B-29 pilot. He's measuring the distance between pin centers on the left landing gear. This part of the job isn't so glamorous. But it's the pilot's responsibility to make sure that everything on this biggest bomber in the world works properly. If you were a B-29 pilot, here's exactly what you'd have to do before an operational flight. Check the nose wheel. See that the tires are inflated to 45 to 50 pounds per square inch. While measuring the pressure, look over the tires for general condition also. Watch out especially for cuts or signs of serious wear. One of the ground crew will replace the dust covers, but you're still responsible for his work. After you've measured the pressure in both tires, give the gear a visual check. The strut should be clean, with a clearance between pin centers of 10 inches. And the shimmy damper must be full. That's important. Make sure the rod is almost up to the notch in the gauge on the shimmy damper reservoir. Now you can look over the engine cowlings on your way to the other main landing wheel. This gets the same inspection you've already given its mate. The co-pilot ducks into the wheel well to inspect the equipment there, while you work on the wheels. Measure tire pressures again. On these tires, the pressure should be between 75 and 85 pounds per square inch. Inside the wheel well, the co-pilot examines the wires, connections, and switches. He makes sure all the cannon plugs are on tight, paying particular attention to the plugs on this motor, which opens and closes the nacelle doors and also to the plugs of the normal and emergency landing gear motors. Then he turns around to examine his side of the strut. He looks it over and inspects the brake lines, making sure that the hose is not chafing and no fluid is leaking. Meanwhile, you're checking the clearance between pin centers again. 13 and 1 quarter inches. Right. Now, are the wheel chocks in place? One behind the inboard tire and one in front of the outboard tire, just as it should be. Next, check the cowlings, inspection doors, and inspection plates. You've already examined some of them, but you must be sure all of them are okay. The other members of the crew help you out with these inspections. Here, for example, a gunner tests the fastening of the top cowling. But you'll have to check the security of the other coverings, and there are a lot of them all over this ship. 
While you're walking along, you can examine the wing seams. Fluid leaking from them means trouble. Now to check the ailerons and trim tabs. All control surfaces and all trim tabs must be inspected. Test the tabs for excessive hinge play by shaking them and see that the gas tank caps are tightened. If there were extra fuel tanks in the bomb bays, their connections would have to be examined. But now the pilot and the co-pilot continue their tour around the plane. They have a lot to check. Hatches, windows, control surfaces, trim tabs, inspection plates and doors. But the pilot and co-pilot aren't the only crew members with inspections to make. The gunners, for example, besides helping the pilot check the airplane, must also be sure the guns and gun cameras will work properly. They must inspect all five turrets in the same way they're now examining this lower rear turret. After they have the dome and gun cover removed, they see that the ammunition moves freely in the chutes and is correctly loaded. The guns just don't fire with the cartridges in backwards. They also check the safety wiring on the gun mounting bolts, up in there. Then the gun charging switches are put on reset. That conserves the CO2 pressure, which automatically charges the guns. Finally, the gun camera is inspected. Enough film, speed set at 16 frames per second, lens adjusted to the brightness of the day, and the interval control put at the desired number of seconds and turned on. And this turret is all right. The dome and gun cover can be replaced. The tail turret is checked by the tail gunner. But again, the pilot is responsible. If the guns fail, he gets the blame. So he watches the tail gunner as the Shatterall feed mechanism is inspected. Now the other gunners only have to lock the latches. Elevation latch locked. Azimuth latch locked. The doors are shut and fastened. And the gunners can go to another turret. And there's still more work to be done. Each engine must be pulled through 15 blades, with only two men per blade. The engineer takes care of that. He sits at his position, making sure that all switches are off, while the four engines are pulled through. And now the co-pilot puts on his clothing and collects his equipment before joining the rest of the crew for inspection. Notice that the crew members wear fatigues while making their inspections, and change into flight clothing only when they are ready to enter the plane. The examination of the exterior of the airplane is completed. So the crew can fall in for the check of their personal equipment. That's the last item of the before entering the airplane part of the procedure. And it's strictly the pilot's job. Your job. You are responsible for the men as well as the plane. If they fail, you're at fault. Each crew member must have his electrically heated flying clothing, parachute, oxygen mask, knife, a quart of water, and May West. Steel helmets and flak vests are already inside the ship at the positions. Apparently these men are completely equipped. Now you're all ready to start the engines, and the rest of the crew should be too. Warn the service crew outside you're going to start the engines, and tell the engineer to start number one. And number one engine spins twice. And now he turns the fuel boost pump on, closes all the throttles except number one, sets the fire extinguisher to number one engine, presses the starter switch to energize, and then flips it to start. And finally turns the magneto switch to both. As the ship is turned around at the far end of the runway, notice again how the engines are used for steering. You can see the right propellers moving faster than the left. When you're at right angles to the runway, stop for the engine run-up. As you gather speed, slowly advance the throttles to full power and set the throttle brake. Manifold pressure should go up to 47 or 47.5 inches. RPM should go up to 2,600. Continue accelerating down the runway until the indicated airspeed gets up to 95 miles per hour. Then slowly pull the control column back, putting the ship in a flying attitude. 
The plane takes off without further action on your part when it gets flying speed. The exact speed at which it will leave the ground depends on the weight. When the ship is airborne, apply the brakes to stop the wheels and then have the co-pilot retract the landing gear. He has to hold the landing gear retracting switch in the up position because the switch is spring loaded. The co-pilot makes sure the nose gear is up by looking through the inspection door on the floor of the cockpit just ahead of the aisle stand. The wheel is there, all right. At 160 miles per hour and 500 feet altitude, the co-pilot retracts the flaps, snapping the switch on and off until the indicator shows that the flaps are all the way up. The side gunners should be watching from their blisters as the plane takes off. They tell the co-pilot when the flaps and landing gear are up. Now you ought to change from takeoff power setting to climbing. Adjust the manifold pressure selector until the manifold pressure drops to 43 inches. And decrease propeller RPM to bring the tachometers to 2400. It's a big, heavy, and powerful airplane. Bigger, heavier, and more powerful than anything you've ever flown. For that reason, it must be handled gently and precisely. You must carefully follow the prescribed procedures. Even a super bomber is no good to the army if it's in little busted up pieces. But don't get jittery. The 29 is a sweet ship to handle. When it stalls, the nose drops so that the plane automatically recovers. There is no tendency to spin. Stalling speed varies quite a bit naturally depending on weight and other conditions. But generally it's between 84 and 135 miles per hour. When turning or executing any maneuver, take it easy. This is a big plane, remember, not a fighter. Yet fairly steep turns can be made safely. This 30 degree bank can also be done with full flaps. That's about the limit. And when evasive action is necessary, you have plenty of tricks to pull. Just watch this B-29. And the B-29 does more than just fly well. It packs a terrific wallop, a wallop enemy fighters will quickly learn to fear. That turret you see moving is only one of the five on the ship, which mounts a total of 10 machine guns and one cannon. When the plane has slowed down to 180 miles per hour or less, order the co-pilot to lower the landing gear. When the switch is set to the down position, the wheels descend all the way, lock, and the gear motors automatically stop. When the left and right gear are down, the side gunners, who should now be watching the wheels and flaps, will report to the co-pilot. He himself can make sure the nose wheel has been lowered all the way by looking through the window in the floor of the cockpit. Next, the flaps should come down. If you've been in combat, the co-pilot should lower them first only five degrees. If they were damaged, lowering them all the way might rip them off the wing. The gunners can look them over and report on their condition. The flaps are all right, so the co-pilot can lower them 25 degrees. Notice that he snaps the switch on and off. That way the flaps descend gradually and a sudden change in the lift characteristics of the airplane is avoided. The gunners will report when the flaps appear to be down 25 degrees. And the co-pilot can check by looking at his wing flap position indicator. 
Now make a standard approach, keeping the speed about 30 miles per hour above stalling. And on the final approach, order the co-pilot to lower the flaps all the way. When you touch the ground, the plane should be slightly tail low and going between 95 and 100 miles per hour. Notice how the main wheels bear most of the shock of landing. Then the ship slowly settles forward. Don't apply brakes immediately. Let the plane lose some of its speed rolling. Yes, you start with an inspection and finish with an inspection. If there was anything wrong, now is the time to find out about it. And now is the time to correct it. Yes, this is the airplane that you've been promised. Now it's up to you to weld this airplane and its crew into a single irresistible instrument of destruction. That can be your promise to us. Originally, Plans were to deploy the B-29 against targets in Germany from bases in Egypt. But as the war progressed in Europe, a new plan was created, at the direction of President Roosevelt, as a promise to China. Operation Matterhorn. B-29s would attack Japan from four forward bases in southern China and five main bases in India. It was a costly plan, because there was no overland connection available between India and China. So all supplies had to be flown over the Himalayas. You guessed it, otherwise known as the hump. Supplies came either by transport aircraft or by B-29s themselves, with some aircraft being stripped of armor and guns and used to deliver fuel. B-29s started to arrive in India in early April of 1944. The very first B-29 combat mission was flown on June 5th of 44. 77 out of dispatched 98 B-29s launched from India for a bombing mission against a railroad yard in Bangkok. Five B-29s were lost during the mission, however none to hostile fire. The raid, which did minor damage to the target, in fact only one bomb actually hit the target, it exhausted the fuel supplies at the B-29 bases, resulting in a slowdown of operations until fuel could be replenished. In addition to logistical problems associated with operations from China, the B-29 could only reach a limited part of Japan while flying from those bases. The solution to the problem was to capture the Mariana Islands, which would bring the targets like Tokyo within the range of the B-29. So the B-29 story is directly connected to the fight for the Mariana Islands, which include Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. In June of 1944, Operation Forager was launched to secure the Marianas. This led to the Battle of the Philippine Sea. The opposing forces in the battle for the Marianas were the United States Navy's Task Force 58, led by Admiral Raymond Spruance. The Japanese mobile fleet was commanded by Vice Admiral Yuzaburo Azawa. The American fleet comprised of multiple aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. On the other hand, the Japanese fleet had been severely depleted by previous engagements, was relying heavily on their aircraft carriers. The U.S. forces invaded Saipan on June 15, 1944, and despite a Japanese naval counterattack and heavy fighting on land, Saipan was secured by July 9, with operations following against Guam and Tinian. All three islands were secured by August. The sea portion of the Battle of the Philippine Sea began on June 19, 1944, with a series of intense airstrikes and naval skirmishes. American carrier aircraft inflicted considerable damage on the Japanese fleet during the initial encounter. However, the main engagement that earned the battle its iconic name, the Marianas Turkey Shoot, occurred June 20th and 21st, 1944. The term Turkey Shoot originated from the lopsided nature of the aerial battle that unfolded. The American carrier-based aircraft confronted Japanese aircraft in overwhelming numbers. The Japanese, in a counteroffensive, 
desperately attempting to thwart the impending Allied invasion, retaliated by launching massed kamikaze attacks. American pilots, benefiting from superior aircraft and training and intelligence, engaged the Japanese aircraft with lethal results. The skies over the Philippine Sea became a chaotic battleground, with American pilots downing Japanese planes in staggering numbers. The disparity in aerial capabilities and tactics turned the confrontation into a one-sided affair. The battle had a devastating impact on the Japanese mobile fleet. The loss of carrier-based aircraft, coupled with the sinking of three Japanese carriers, significantly weakened Japan's naval air power. The remaining Japanese carriers were forced to retreat, leaving the Philippines vulnerable to the impending Allied invasion. During the battle, the United States launched almost a thousand carrier-based aircraft. This included the Grumman F-6F Hellcat and the Grumman TBF Avengers. The Japanese deployed 430 carrier-based aircraft, including Mitsubishi A6M Zeros and D-3A Val Dive Bombers. On the U.S. side, we lost 123 aircraft. The Japanese loss included 346 destroyed aircraft in addition to the loss of three carriers. The Marianas Turkey shoot was a resounding victory for the Allies. The elimination of Japanese carrier-based aircraft and the loss of the carriers weakened Japan's defensive capabilities in the Pacific. The successful invasion of the Marianas set the stage for subsequent Allied offensives, including the liberation of the Philippines. With the islands now secure, the combat engineers, or Seabees, descended upon the island in August to build suitable facilities for the B-29 fleet. The first B-29s arrived on Saipan on October 12, 1944 and the first combat mission was launched from there on October 28th of 44, with 14 B-29s attacking the truck Atoll. The 73rd Bombing Wing launched the first B-29 mission against the Japanese mainland November 24th of 1944, sending 111 B-29s to attack Tokyo. The campaign of incendiary raids started with the bombardment of Kobe on February 4th, 1945, and peaked with the most destructive bombing raid in the history on the night of March 9th and 10th, 1945, on Tokyo. The raids increased, being launched regularly until the end of the war. The attack succeeded in devastating most large Japanese cities and gravely damaged Japan's war industry. Although less publicized, the mining of the Japanese ports and shipping routes conducted by B-29s from April 1945 reduced Japan's ability to support its population and move its troops. The Marianas provided a vital base for Allied air operations. B-29 bombers stationed on Saipan, Tinian, and Guam played a crucial role in the final stages of the war, of course including the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Another aircraft making history in 1944 was the Douglas A-26 Invader. Originally designed as a medium bomber, it was developed to succeed the A-20 Havoc, the aircraft featured a sleek design, powerful engines, and a versatile payload capacity. Introduced in 1943, the A-26 started making its mark in combat in June of 1944, demonstrating its adaptability in separate roles. Although the Pacific Theater was primarily the domain of the B-29, the A-26 first saw action on June 23rd of 44, when four aircraft attacked the Japanese-held islands near New Guinea. These were based with the 3rd Bombardment Group's 13th Squadron, otherwise known as the Grim Reapers. Equipped with forward-facing machine guns and rockets, it became a weapon against enemy shipping and ground targets. Its speed, at more than 350 miles per hour, allowed it to invade enemy defenses and strike with precision. As the Allies pushed back against German forces in Europe, the A-26 played a critical role in tactical bombing missions, close air support for ground troops, and interdiction operations. Its speed, agility, and ability to carry a wide range of munitions made it effective in low-level attacks against enemy positions. The Douglas A-26 Invader continued to serve beyond the end of World War II, seeing action in Korea and into the Vietnam War. While the Invader made its operational debut in June of 1944 in the Pacific, the Northrop P-61 Black Widow also made its combat debut in June of 1944. The need for a dedicated night fighter became apparent as the air war over Europe and the Pacific intensified. Northrop designed the P-61 Black Widow to fill this role. 
The aircraft was specifically developed to counter the threat of enemy bombers at night, utilizing advanced technology for detection and interception. The P-61's first operational deployment took place on the night of July 26 into 27, 1944, with the 422nd Night Fighter Squadron of the U.S. Army Air Forces. During the mission, a pair of P-61s took off to intercept German bombers. One of the Black Widows, piloted by Lieutenant Hermann Ernst, successfully intercepted and shot down a German Dornier DO-217 bomber, marking the first confirmed kill by a P-61 Black Widow in combat, and established the aircraft's reputation as a formidable night fighter. The P-61 continued to prove its worth in subsequent operations, contributing to a reduction of German bombing threats during the later stages of World War II. The Black Widow's success in the European theater paved the way for its further deployment in the Pacific. In the Pacific theater, the P-61 again played a role in intercepting and engaging, this time Japanese bombers, during their night raids. The SCR-720 radar, mounted in the nose of the aircraft, allowed the crew to detect and track targets. The radar operator played a critical role in guiding the pilot to intercept enemy aircraft. This advanced technology gave the P-61 a significant edge in night operations. While the P-61's operational service during World War II was relatively short-lived, it continued to serve in various capabilities after the war. P-61s were used in experimental projects and testing, contributing further to the development of future night fighting and radar technologies. The Northrop P-61 Black Widow holds a unique place in aviation history as one of the first purpose-built night fighters. Of course, one of the most monumental events in 1944 was the Normandy landings on June 6th. It marked a turning point in World War II in Europe. Now, beyond the amphibious assault on the beaches of Normandy, the success of the invasion hinged on extensive and coordinated air operations. In the months leading up to D-Day, Allied Air Forces undertook a comprehensive strategic bombing campaign to try to soften German defenses and disrupt logistical support. More than 13,000 sorties were flown, delivering approximately 195,000 tons of bombs on key targets. Those targets included transportation hubs, coastal defenses, and communication networks. Now, the airborne component of D-Day involved mass drops of paratroopers and the landing of gliders behind enemy lines. This aerial force was led by the Pathfinder operations, taking off hours before the main aerial invasion force. All told, more than 13,000 paratroopers from the U.S. 82nd Airborne and 101st Airborne Divisions and the British 6th Airborne Division were dropped during the early hours of June 6. Additionally, some 4,000 troops were transported in gliders, aiming to secure key objectives and disrupt German communication and reinforcement routes. Tactical air support was important to the success of the amphibious assault. Allied aircraft provided cover for the landing forces, attacking German positions, and disrupting their ability to counter the invasion. More than 9,000 aircraft participated in tactical air support missions during D-Day. The collaboration between naval and air forces was also evident in the days leading up to D-Day. Approximately 2,200 naval aircraft, including bombers and fighters, conducted reconnaissance missions and aerial bombardment to complement the efforts of the naval fleet. These combined efforts aimed to soften the coastal defenses and create a more favorable environment for the amphibious assault. From strategic bombing campaigns to airborne assaults and tactical air support, the coordinated efforts of the Allied Air Forces played a pivotal role in the invasion. Highlighting the capabilities of air power and the bravery and skill of the pilots, paratroopers, and air crews, underscoring the significance of air operations in shaping the course of history during World War II. As the summer of 1944 turned to fall, a new weapon made its appearance to strike terror into the Allied territories, especially the British homeland. It was the German V-2 rocket. The V-2, also known as the A-4, was a groundbreaking development in rocketry. Created by a team of German scientists led by Werner von Braun, the development of the V-2 began in the early 1930s, gaining momentum as World War II progressed. The project aimed to create a long-range guided ballistic missile that could deliver a warhead to its target with unprecedented speed and accuracy. The V-2 was powered by a liquid-fueled rocket engine using a combination of liquid oxygen and alcohol. 
It employed an innovative guidance system featuring gyroscopes and accelerometers to correct its trajectory during its flight. The rocket reached a speed of over 3,000 miles per hour and had an operational range that allowed it to strike targets as far away as London. The first combat launch occurred at Pinamunde. The subsequent launches targeted London and Antwerp, Belgium. The rocket's supersonic speed and high altitude made it extremely difficult to intercept, giving it a distinct advantage over traditional bombing rates. The V-2's operational history included more than 3,000 launches, primarily against Allied cities, causing significant destruction and casualties. The V-2 had a profound impact on the cities it targeted. London experienced the devastation of V-2 attacks causing widespread damage and civilian casualties. But the rocket attacks were also a psychological weapon, instilling fear and uncertainty among the civilian population. The V-2 was the first instance of a ballistic missile being used in warfare, foreshadowing the role that such weapons would play in later conflicts. Despite the destructive impact of the V-2 rockets, they also advanced rocket technology the scientists and engineers involved in the V-2 program, including von Braun, were instrumental in the development of post-war space programs, most notably NASA. After the war, these German scientists were recruited by the United States and the Soviet Union in the race for space exploration during the Cold War. The development, operational history, and impact of the German V-2 rocket represent a complex and significant chapter in the history of military technology. While its use during World War II caused destruction and terror, the scientific advancements made in the process had a lasting impact on space exploration and in missile development in the post-war era. I thank you for joining us tonight as we take a look back at 1944. Again, don't forget to click that like, subscribe, or follow button so we can let you know about future shows. As always, if you have ideas for future topics, we'd love to hear from you. Send Leah Block an email at media at CAFHQ. Dot .org. Until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night.